Scott was a professor at Penn. He's an internist and a, and a neuroscientist. And in December of 1998, he was, noticed that the, his tennis racket was slipping out of his hand. You know, by January, he and I knew that this was the presumptive diagnosis. So uh, our father was diagnosed in, uh, with ALS in 1999. He very uh, quickly deteriorated. He had a trach uh, put in in the fall of 2001. So two years in, he was in a wheelchair from then on. So in the mid-2000s, a team from Albany contacted Dad and came up with an arrangement whereby Dad would be the, among the first, if not the first, to use this technology. Uh, and he would sort of be their guinea pig. So they allowed him to use the technology and he would regularly send data back to Albany. And that was, that was how the BCI train uh, first got rolling. Scott was the first person to use brain computer interface technology in real life, so in everyday life and, and especially for work. That was, that was pretty special. So as you can see, your EEG data was looking much better for that one, which is why you were able to spell camp on the screen. It's really as simple as interfacing with the brain the same way you would interface with a computer or a car. And that's what brain computer interfacing is. You're trying to uh, either extract signals from the brain and interpret them to create something useful, or you're trying to send things back to the brain in order to facilitate change. Dad was clear from the basically the beginning of his diagnosis that he was going to continue to push on as long as he had the ability to communicate with his family and the ability to continue the work that he loved. And BCI uh, enabled him to continue, not just continue, but to really thrive uh, doing both of those things in spite of his diagnosis. The, the fact that he saw where technology was going, actually, and the fact that he'd be able to continue his work were actually two of the reasons why he decided to get a tracheostomy and continue, which, which drastically ex extends the lifespan of, of patients with ALS. He could actually write us emails. And, and texts and, you know, be spontaneous, his spontaneous independent self, or someone else, he wasn't dictating to someone else to write it. It's just amazing to see someone go from not being able to communicate with their family or their loved ones um, to being able to say simple things like, I love you, or practical things like, I need to go to the bathroom. Shortly after dad's diagnosis, when we realized how expensive the assistive technology can be uh, and how critical it is for patients in the area, our family really at Dad's behest started the uh, Scott Mackler Assistive Technology Fund. We really worked in our life, in, well, during Scott's life and now, to, to get technology to these, pa to these patients. So we've you know, raised a couple million dollars, I think, just so that the Technology Fund at the ALS Association of Greater Philadelphia can, can get these devices to patients who need them so that they can have the, as full a life as Scott did. I'd say we're honoring the promise of the ALS Association in trying to help those patients being them be able to have access to that technology and live effective, relatively independent and meaningful lives as patients with ALS. The vertical lines are where the classifier is being chosen. The, okay. These are the regions. In terms of the future, this work that Dr. Geronimo at Hershey is doing is going to make this technology available to patients around the country, no matter how far away they are from an ALS clinical center. And that can be really game changing for these patients. BCI research, since its inception, has been done either by having patients come to clinic or by sending the researcher into the home. We're looking at how to fundamentally restructure ALS care by having patients do assessments in the home, um, by having them um, complete uh, either partial visits in clinic and partial visits over the phone or over the internet, and uh, participate in research through telemedicine as well. My hope is to help uh, no patient lose their voice so that they're always able to communicate um, for in any way, no matter how, no matter how bad the disease gets, because uh, you can imagine how, how bad that would be.